The words to which I should like to call your attention this morning are to be found in the Gospel according to St. John, in chapter 20, verses 30 and 31, the last two verses in the 20th chapter of the Gospel according to St. John. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. But these are written that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. We might equally well take as our text the 12th verse in the first chapter of this gospel according to St. John. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of men, but of God. Now, I propose, God willing, during the following Sunday mornings, not to to give a detailed consecutive exposition of the Gospel according to St. John, but rather to pick out uh, what we may call the application of the teaching which is found in this Gospel uh, to uh, the state and the condition of the Christian in this world. This uh, is the last of the Gospels, according to all authorities, and undoubtedly that does seem to be the case. And that gives to this Gospel a certain peculiar significance. It's always been recognized that there is something essentially different about this Gospel, as contrasted with the other three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And it seems to me that this is the great and essential difference. They're all, of course, meant to be portraits of our Lord and Savior. But in this Gospel, according to John, there is more application. There is a greater emphasis placed upon the bearing of all this upon us as believers. That is why we shall find that Our Lord himself, towards the end of his ministry, gave more time and attention to this preparation of his people for the days which were ahead and in which they would have to face the problems of life and living apart from him actually in person. In other words, there is a fuller teaching about the doctrine of the Holy Spirit in this gospel according to St. John than there is in any other one of the gospels. And it is in particular to that doctrine that I want to direct attention. Now, I say this is the last of the Gospels. It's, uh, it was written to Christian people who had been in the Christian life for some time. A number of years had passed since our Lord's life and death and resurrection and ascension. Now, why was it that John ever wrote this Gospel? That's always a good question to ask about any book in the Bible. Why was it written? What drew it for? We must never think of these men as just literary men. The literary man writes because he enjoys doing so and he does so to make a living. But these were not literary men. These were practical men. They were apostles and they were evangelists and teachers and so on. And they only wrote in a sense when they had to write. And it's perfectly clear as to why John wrote this particular gospel. It was written in order to strengthen and to establish and to encourage these first century Christians. And from that we deduce, of course, that they needed that. They were obviously people who had become discouraged in various ways and for various reasons. We know that they were subjected to a great deal of very cruel persecution. The first Jews who believed were persecuted by their own fellow countrymen. They were persecuted likewise by the Gentiles. And the Gentile believers in exactly the same way were subjected to very grievous persecution. 
In other words, they had these great trials and troubles. And that in and of itself immediately produced a problem. There is always a tendency on the part of Christian people to think and to believe that the moment you become a Christian, it's the end of all your troubles. It's quite wrong, of course, to believe that, but people will persist in doing it. And the result is that when trials and troubles come, they're taken aback, they're surprised. They begin to query the gospel and to wonder whether it's true after all. Now, there were people like that in the first century, exactly as there are today. There are those who think that this Gospel of John was written after A.D. 70. Well, we can't determine that exactly. It may have been, it may not have been. If it was after A.D. 70, well, we can quite understand how they felt. The city of Jerusalem had been attacked and destroyed. The Romans ruled over all, everywhere. The Jews, as it were, were cast out. It was a shattering experience for the Jews. No question about that. Well, very well, that may have been a part of this or it may not have been, whether it was or not, I say, there were sufficient uh, persecutions and trials and troubles and difficulties. That's the background to the, this gospel. That's why it was written. You see, you get exactly the same thing with the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, by this same man, John. Why did he write it? Well, he wrote it again to comfort people. You see, the whole business of the book of Revelation is to comfort Christians. It was meant to comfort the first century Christians. The book of Revelation wasn't written for this generation to which you and I belong. It was written to the first century Christians to enable them to face these calamities and terrible trials that came upon them. They were not only hailed before the magistrates and the powers, there were large numbers of them who were literally massacred, put to death in a most cruel manner. It was the spot, you remember, of the aristocracy of Rome in those times to go to the Colosseum and other places and watch the poor Christians being thrown to the lions in the arena. Now, that's the kind of background. But on top of that, there was another factor. They'd been taught in the preaching that the Lord Jesus Christ would come again, would come back again into this world to wind up his great work, to put an end to history and introduce his kingdom. But the years were passing and he hadn't come. And there were many who were troubled by that. Again, beginning to wonder whether the message was true or not. They'd had this great promise, this blessed hope, but nothing seemed to be happening concerning it. And then, in addition, there was false teaching. Now, this is the thing that I want to emphasize most of all, because it was undoubtedly the main factor which led John to write this gospel, as probably it led the others to write their gospels under the influence of the Holy Spirit. False teaching. False teaching about what? Well, especially about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, of course, this is basic and central. I needn't weary with a catalogue of the various false ideas with regard to his person. They nearly all appeared in the first century. There is nothing new, there is nothing modern about wrong ideas about the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's get hold of that. There are many people who think that this is something quite modern and that to say that Jesus of Nazareth was only a man is the hallmark of modernity and being up to date. They said it in the first century. There's nothing new at all about it. All that these foolish people are saying today and thinking they're very clever and sophisticated in doing so about the Lord and about the Old Testament, it is indeed as old almost as this book itself. There's nothing new about it at all. You're not being clever, you're not being learned by doing such things. You're simply repeating what men have done from the very beginning. Now, there were many forms of this. These were the two main ones. There were those, you see, who said, oh yes, he is the Son of God, but... Uh, he never really was truly man. He never had a human body. It's called ascetism. Well, yes, they said, uh, Jesus of Nazareth is the eternal Son of God. But he only appeared uh, to be incarnate. He hadn't a real body. It was a sort of phantom body. That was one heresy, ascetism. Another was to say that uh, Jesus of Nazareth was only a man but that upon the man Jesus at the baptism, the eternal Christ came, entered into him. 
and that he remained in him until the cross, and that on the cross, the moment he was nailed to the cross, the eternal Christ left him, so that it was only the man, Jesus, who died. Now, that was a very popular uh, heresy that was taught at that time by a man called Corinthus. And there's a very famous story told about this very apostle John and Corinthus. John one day was going into a public bath, and he was told as he was entering that Corinthus was there in one of the baths, and John immediately turned round and walked out. He wouldn't even be in the same building as this heretic Corinthus. He so hated the doctrine because it detracted from the glory of his Lord and Master. Well, now, this is the background, you see. This is why John came to write his gospel. He says, these things are written that ye may know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that knowing and believing this, you might have life uh, through his name. You see, the, the church was being disturbed by these false teachings, and on top of it all, there were the so-called apocryphal gospels. Different people were writing lives, biographies of the Lord Jesus Christ. Apocryphal Gospels, there were large numbers of them. And uh, all these things were confusing these members of the early church. It was a great problem in the early centuries. These apocryphal Gospels, which were rejected by the church, again under the leading of the Holy Spirit, and were never incorporated in our New Testament. But people still get excited about them. Recently there was excitement about a so-called Gospel of Thomas. And I was amazed at Christian people wondering whether they were going to get something new and fresh. You don't waste your time, my dear friend. Everything you need to know is here. You needn't get excited about any apocryphal Gospels. They never add. They always detract. There is always something which is merely human and imaginative about them. That's why the church, in her wisdom, rejected them. It's a bad sign when a man gets interested in these supposed discoveries as if he's going to get a fresh glimpse of truth. It's all here in what we've got before us. You don't need anything more. But these early Christians were being misled by these things. And now it was because of all that that John came to write his gospel. You see, the effect of all this was that these Christian people had become depressed. They'd become uncertain. They were confused. They said, what are we to believe? And the result of all that was that their lives and their enjoyment of the Christian life and their experience of it was also suffering. Now, it was to deal with that very situation that John wrote this gospel. Now, I hope we're all clear about this. The gospels, like everything else in the New Testament, were written for Christian believers. They were not written for the world. They were written for believers. You see, Luke tells us in his gospel, he writes to the men to whom he wrote, to this man Theophilus, it seemed good to me also, having a perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write unto thee, in order, most excellent Theophilus, that thou mightest know the certainty of these things wherein thou hast been instructed. They were written, in other words, in order to confirm and establish the early Christians and to deliver them from this condition of uncertainty and unhappiness, this kind of lethargy that had come upon them and this consequent feeling of hopelessness. Now, this is to me a most important and a most vital principle. All this is for Christian people primarily in order that we might have Assurance and certainty concerning these things. Very well. The thing, therefore, that I'm anxious to call your attention to this morning is this, is the way in which John deals with such a situation. Depressed, unhappy, uncertain Christians. People not enjoying the fullness of the Christian life. John looks at them in amazement. And he says to himself, as it were, what can I do with these people? What is exactly the message that they need? Now notice what he doesn't do. He doesn't merely write them a letter of comfort. A letter of general comfort. 
I'm beginning to think, my dear friends, that the modern Christian church is dying of comfort. The idea seems to be current that the main function of Christianity is to give us some comfort. Well, of course, in an ultimate sense, it does, and it's the only thing that does. But, you know, a Christian church is not just a nice place, and Christian people are not just meant to be nice people. And a Christian preacher is not just meant to be a nice man who makes people feel a little bit nicer and more comfortable and happy while they're in a church. But, you know, that seems to me to be the thing that's happening. Are you not appalled at the present state of the Christian church? Our ineffectiveness, the masses outside, and the arrogance and the sin. What's the matter? Why don't they come to the Christian church? Well, I must confess, I'm, I'm more than ever convinced that they don't come because of what they see in the Christian church. And what they see in the Christian church is a number of nice people. A number of people who seem to be wanting comfort, sentimental, emotional. That's what they see, but that's not the Christian church. My dear friends, the Christian church is meant to be an army with banners. Never was she so needed in the world as she is at the present time. And yet one sees her... People coming to churches, I'm not of necessity referring to this congregation, but other congregations, there's a great value, you know, in having a holiday and uh, slipping into churches here and there, little chapels up and down the country and just seeing what's happening. And one gets the impression that people go there in order to be praised, in order to be comforted, in order to be told nice and soothing things. But that's not the business of Christianity, and John doesn't do it. He doesn't merely give them some general comfort. He doesn't even make an appeal to them. What does he do then? Well, he gives them instruction. These things are written. There is much more, he says, that I could write. Did you notice it there at the end? He says that if all the things that Jesus did were written, the, the world itself wouldn't be big enough to contain the book that would have to be written. Many other things which Jesus did, this is the last verse of his gospel, the which if they should be written every one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that should be written. Many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written, why? Well, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that believing ye might have life through his name. This is written to Christians. But you say, Christians do believe it. I know. In a sense, we do, don't we? But the question is, do we really believe it? He says that you may really believe and know what it means to believe, and that you might have life through his name. But surely, as Christians, they've got life, yes, but there's the difference between the life of an infant and the life of a man. There's a difference between the life of a healthy infant and the life of a marasmic infant. There's a little infant, skin and bones and nothing else still breathing, but you're not pleased with it, you're not proud of it. It's alive, you say, yes, but is that life? Of course it isn't. That's just existence. The child's not meant to be like that. Well, now then, John writes, I say, in order to get the church out of this marasmic, unhealthy, morbid condition. And what he does is to give it instruction. He writes his gospel. The doctrine of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And secondly, the possibilities for us because he is who and what he is. That's what you need, says John. So he writes his gospel. And I'm suggesting that the others were written in exactly the same way. Well now, my friends, isn't this our greatest need at the present time? What sort of a picture are we presenting to the world? What kind of impression are we giving of Christianity? Are we giving the impression to the world that it is the most wonderful and glorious thing that the human race and civilizations have ever known? Are we giving them the impression that when a man becomes a Christian, everything is new and changed and different? He is delivered, emancipated, set free, filled with a glory and a power. Is that it? John will go on to say, I hope to consider it with you, of his fullness have we received and grace upon grace. Are we giving that impression? This to me is tragic. The world's on fire. The world's desperate. It doesn't know what to do with There's no message. And here's the only message. But it comes through us. And we've no right to blame the world. 
for judging Christianity through us. It's a perfectly fair thing to do. We are its representatives. We are the guardians and the custodians of the faith. The world is absolutely right in judging it through us. You can't expect them to do anything else. But what do they find as they look at us? What's the matter with us? That's the question. Why are so many of us depressed Christians? Why do so many of us, I say, come to the house of God in order just to get a little Philip or a nice feeling or a bit of encouragement or a sympathy or any one of these things? Why is it that so many of us are mechanical in our Christian life? Having to push ourselves, to press ourselves, to remind ourselves that we are Christians, regarding it as a matter of duty, and rather proud of ourselves because we do attend a place of worship and do this and that. Oh, what an utter travesty it all is of Christianity. If we give the impression that we really are rather proud of ourselves for being here at this moment instead of going to the seaside on a wonderful day like this. It's obviously going to be a very sunny day. It'll be wonderful at the seaside, but we've made a great sacrifice. We've come to the house of God. Is that the impression we give? Well, if it is, I'm not surprised that the majority of people in this country are outside the Christian church. But it's all wrong, my friends. There were so many of these early Christians, as I've reminded you, who gladly faced ostracism from their families and nearest and dearest because of what they'd found in this. They were ready to be persecuted. They were thrown into prison. They were ready to face martyrdom. They thanked God that at last they'd been accounted worthy to suffer shame for his namesake. Martyrdom to them was the final crown of glory to be allowed to die for him. That was the spirit. That's the spirit that conquered the ancient world. There's no doubt about it. That is how Christianity spread. And you and I must come back to this. I say that our responsibility is tremendous at this present time. You and I, my friends, are going to be judged by God in eternity as to our witness and our testimony in this evil hour in the history of the world in which we find ourselves. What have we done to bring this gospel to the notice of the masses of the people? What impression are we giving with respect to it and its nature? That's the question, and that is the matter on which we shall all be judged. What do we need, therefore? Well, I say that we are in the same position as in some of these people to whom John was writing. We don't need comfort. I mean by that we don't need comfort directly. The comfort of the gospel comes through the truth, not directly. In other words, my primary task here is not to give comfort. It is to introduce you to him, the friend that sticketh closer than a brother. If I comfort you, I'm acting as a drug to you. But you see, that's what's passing as Christianity today. It's called psychology. So much of what is being preached today is nothing but psychology, dishonestly using Christian terminology. It is psychological treatment of men and women to get them over their fears and phobias and anxieties and sleeplessness and many another thing. That's not the business of the gospel. John doesn't send these people a little bit of psychology. He doesn't give them comfort directly and immediately. No, no. That's not the business of Christian preaching. That's not our function. That's not our purpose. It isn't to say anything that can be done directly by us. We don't need comfort. We don't need psychological treatment. But you listen to it. That's why I'm calling your attention to it, my friends. I do trust we're not being misled by this kind of thing. Listen to it on your television and on your wireless and read it wherever you like, and this is what you get. It's some vague, general, comforting, psychological talk supposed to make us feel happy as we go to sleep and to help us to sleep. And nothing of this glorious message. So often nothing about the person himself. As if Christianity is just some nice soothing syrup to make life a little bit easier and more bearable. It's a travesty of Christianity. It isn't Christianity. It's not surprising the world is as it is. It's not surprising the Christian church is as she is. We don't even need exhortations. We don't even need appeals. There's so much of that again. People are being appealed to, to this, that, and the other. They're being exhorted. They're being organized into activities. That isn't what we need either. 
All our activities are to be the result of our understanding of the truth. Everything. We don't need appeals. We don't need exhortations. We don't need spiritual clinics. In the first instance, these are not the need. But people, you see, are concerned about these things. We're all so subjective. This sin that's getting me down, that's the thing. What can you tell me about this sin? And then I concentrate on this sin and give a little psychological treatment. No, no, that's the wrong way. The answer to all is what John gives here. Teaching, doctrine. Don't look at the individual problems. Get at the ultimate source of the trouble. All these individual problems are not, nothing but symptoms of a great central disease. So John says, now then I know your state and condition. I know you're muddled and confused by these apocryphal gospels and by these heretics who are teaching you various things. I know that you're discouraged because of your trials and your tribulations. Therefore, I want to help you. And this is how I'm going to help you. In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God. And the Word was God. That's how John does it. That's the only way, my dear friends. It's the way of every reformation. It's the way of every revival. Teaching. You know what's the matter with us? I'll tell you what's the matter with us. We none of us rarely believe in him. The trouble with all of us is that we don't know enough about him. So John says the thing you need above everything is to be brought to this knowledge of him who he is, what he's done, what he's made possible for us. But you notice the blending of the two things. And here is my main emphasis for this morning. These things are written that ye may know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, the great doctrine of the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, but secondly, and that believing ye might have life through his name. Or oh, here it is, if you like, in this twelfth verse of this first chapter. As many as received him to them, gave ye power to become the sons of God. As many as received him. There it is, the great objective doctrine. Yes, but says John, I'm not merely going to write to you about him and give you the doctrine concerning him in order that I may fill up your heads with a theoretical knowledge I want you to have life. The two things you see go together. The knowledge and the life. The doctrine and the experience. The understanding. The working out of it in the daily life and experience and walk. Now these are two things that must never be separated. The moment these are separated we are lost. And of course they are being separated. There are some people who put the whole of their emphasis upon the doctrine, the objectivity the theology, and so on. And they stop at that. But of course, their lives are quite useless. People may say, all right, you're interested in that. I'm interested in something else. They, they want to see what it does in actual practice and in daily life and living. Is there life here? But then you see there are so many, and the majority put their emphasis upon the second thing only and exclude the first. The whole of the emphasis upon our life and experience. We are living in a psychological age, and we are also subjective. We are turning inwards always. We want this and that. We start with ourselves. Man is the center of the universe, we believe. And it's absolutely fatal. Because if you set out wanting life only, well, all the cults will come and meet you and they say, here it is. Here's the very thing you want. You want happiness? You want cure for insomnia? Do you want peace? Do you want guidance? Here it is. It's all for you. So simple and for nothing. And people fall for it and they accept it. No, no, my friends, these things must never be separated. We must believe and come to know that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And we must give proof that we really do believe it and know it by manifesting life, his life, the thrilling life of God in our own souls and in our ordinary practice and behavior. That's the thing, says John. That's why I'm writing this gospel to you, that you may know this. Now there is, as I say, objection to this at the present time. Objection to theology and objection to doctrine. People don't like the order in which John puts these things. They say the doctrine is too difficult, that they haven't got the time to read, that they can't understand. 
It seems to me, you know, that people expect from the Christian church just a pleasant little ten-minute, quarter of an hour address. No more. Can't take any more. They don't want great high doctrine. They say, want something to help us to live. They say, life's difficult, you know. We haven't got time to be bothered with all these doctrines of yours. What's it matter what a man believes as long as somehow or another he feels that Christ helps him? That's the argument today. Believe what you like as long as you get some help out of it. That's it. We... We decide what we want, and we must have it, and if we don't get it, we're annoyed, and we won't take anything else. That is the whole attitude. And it is something that is condemned utterly and completely in the New Testament from beginning to end. Listen, evil communications corrupt good manners. If you go wrong about this resurrection, says Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, you'll very soon go wrong in your life. If you're not right about the fundamentals of your faith, your whole life will go astray. Evil communications corrupt good manners. We've got to start with doctrine. Christian people, do you object to doctrine? Do you object to high doctrine about the Son of God, about his person and about his work? Do you think the Christian church is a place where you just get what you want? Just get that little bit of comfort and solace and so on and no more? Is that it? Well, listen to this. As we are and as we are faced, you know what John gives us? He gives us the prologue to this gospel. Here's the modern man who's so proud of himself with all his learning, all his advances, all his science, all his philosophy and so on. And yet, you see, when he comes to this matter, he says, now, don't give me doctrine and theology, I can't take it, I can't reason, I haven't got the time. I want comfort, I want help. And yet, you see, nearly 2,000 years ago, this is what John gives to similar people. These hard-pressed slaves and servants, as most of them were, these people who were being persecuted and face to face with death, John says, I want to help you. So he starts off, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. These mighty paradoxes, this high and exalted doctrine. And of course, it's what you've got in all your New Testament epistles. It's the same thing in every single one of them. And I'm calling attention to this because, my dear friends, this is the only answer to our condition. We are all suffering from ignorance. Ignorance of the Christian faith. Ignorance with respect to what we are supposed to believe. That's our main trouble. It's not something subjective primarily. It's lack of understanding. So we've got to start with this. And out of it will come the life, the experience, the everything that we need. We can't get it without going in the apostolic manner. Now, why is all this so important? Well, for this reason, you see. Christian teaching is that uh, Christ is the Savior and that the whole of salvation is in him and comes out of him. Not primarily in his teaching, but by what he did and by who, what he was. Now, this is what makes doctrine so crucial. Christian salvation is not to read the teaching of Christ and then to go out and try and practice it. That is a denial of Christian teaching. Any man who says that he can go and put into practice the Sermon on the Mount is already telling me that he is not a Christian. You can't live the Sermon on the Mount until you're a Christian. You've got to be made a Christian first. So, you see, we must start with the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the Savior. He is the salvation. It is of his fullness that we all have received, and grace upon grace. It's this blessed person himself. Very well, then. Can't you see the importance of doctrine? Is he a man only? Well, if he's only a man, well, then he can't save me. Adam was perfect, but Adam fell. Create another perfect man and he will also fail. If Jesus of Nazareth is only a man, he can't be my savior. It takes more than a man to save me. So you see, I'm bound to be concerned about the doctrine of the person of Christ. But is he also, someone may ask, if he was truly a man, well then was he a sinful man? 
You say that he was a man. Very well. You say that the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He was born of the Virgin Mary. She was a sinful woman like everybody else. Everybody born since Adam is born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Very well, he was born of the Virgin Mary. Was he therefore sinful? Was his human nature sinful? Is that an irrelevant question? Is that something which is of no importance to the Christian believer? My dear friend, your whole salvation depends upon these things. If he is a sinful person, he's got to save himself. And no man can save himself. So the Bible is very careful to answer that question and to tell us that he was not sinful. But then someone may say, was he only God? Were the deceitists right? Is Jesus of Nazareth God with a kind of phantom body? He never really became man. He was never truly made flesh. Is that an irrelevant question? Let me show you the relevance of all these matters. If he is nothing but God and never became truly man, well then how can he represent me? What I and the whole human race need is a representative who is one of us and who understands us, who can take our burden upon him and who can stand as our representative before God. Adam was the representative of the whole of mankind. I need a new representative. Yes, but because I'm human, my representative must be human. So I'm very concerned about this. I must know whether he's only God in a phantom body or whether truly he became incarnate. Not only that, it helps me in another way. I need someone who can help me in my temptations and in my infirmities. Yeah, we are in all the trials and the difficulties of life, as I've been reminding you, and as these first Christians were, they were having a difficult and a hard time. John says, here's the doctrine of the person of Christ. You say, how does that help them? It helps them like this. Tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. He's been through it all. He's suffered it all. He was truly men. You see, all my comfort in him as a sympathetic high priest vanishes if he was not Truly men as well as truly God. And then there are other questions. When he came into the world, did he cease to be God? There's a heresy which says that he emptied himself of his Godhead. He was no longer eternal God. That he just now became man only. Well, you see, again, I could easily show you the relevance of that to my whole problem of my personal salvation. There is nothing, in other words, which is so foolish as to say that doctrine doesn't matter to me, that all I need is a bit of direct help and comfort. My answer to all that is this, that as it all comes from him and through him, well, then the first thing I must be certain about is he himself. I must know exactly who he is and what he was and what he's done. What's the meaning of his death upon the cross, for instance? Is that just the death of a pacifist? Is that just the death of a martyr? Is that just the death of an honest person who's not going to recant and withdraw his teaching? What is it? Is that the thing that saves me? Is that the thing that delivers me and reconciles me to God? Or is it just a man loyal to his principles and teaching? It's the most vital question under the sun for me this morning as I'm concerned about my soul and my salvation. I want life. How does he give me life? You see, every one of these questions is a theological question, is a doctrinal question. And John deals with it like this because he knows full well that if men and women are not right and clear in their understanding of him, who he is, what he's done, and what he can do for me, they'll go all together wrong. They'll have some temporary comfort. They'll have a kind of cult. A Jesus cult even, or something else, it'll be of no ultimate value to them. You must be right, he says, about this fundamental thing. So John starts with this great doctrine. Now, it's not my intention, my dear friends, to take you in detail through all these great doctrines. That's not my purpose. I'm just here to show you that unless we have this understanding that John talks about, well, then we got nothing at all, so let's just glance at it. Let me give you my headings as I close. Who is this? What should be my chiefest concern as a Christian? The answer is to know him and to know who he is. 
No, I forget my aches and pains. I forget my insomnia and everything else. What I must know is who he is. If he's what the Bible claims he is, he can deliver me. He can deliver me from anything and everything. One thing I want to know then is who is he? And I'm given the answer. He is eternal God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. Jesus of Nazareth, eternal God. From the beginning, eternally in the presence of his heavenly Father, face to face with God the Father. That's what he tells me. Are you too busy to take it in? How do you think these slaves 2,000 years ago took it in? Haven't you got time? Of course you've got time. Apply your mind, my friend, as you value your life and all your witness in this world and your eternal destiny. Make certain that you're clear about these things. Eternal God, only begotten of the Father. Not created, only begotten, coming out of the Father eternally. He's not a creature. Not only that, he is the Word of God, which means that he is always the expression of the Godhead. He is always the one who is manifesting and revealing the Godhead, the Word of God. But what else? Well, he is the Creator. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. God's plan, of course, is the ultimate, and God is the ultimate planner of creation. But the executive in creation is the Son of God. This is something that is taught constantly in the Scriptures. You remember that great declaration of it in exactly the same way in the epistle to the Hebrews. At the beginning he puts it. God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. He is the creator. He is also the source of all spiritual life and light and understanding. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in the darkness. Now then, here it is. There is no spiritual life apart from this person. There is no knowledge of God. There is no eternal life in the soul. This is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Eternal life is not an experience primarily. It is to know him and to receive of him. That's how the Bible teaches it. So you don't start with yourself and your experience. You look at him. It's the knowledge of him that gives you this life. Here he is then, eternal God, everlasting word, creator, source of all spiritual power. And all spiritual life and existence. And this is the message. This one was coming into the world. He was not that light, but was sent. This is about John the Baptist. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man coming into the world. Now, says John, this is what you need to lay hold on. This is what you really must grasp. You say you've believed it all right, but do you realize what you're believing? Here is this everlasting God, the second person in the blessed Holy Trinity, the only begotten Son of the Father in the bosom of the Father. There he is, the creator of the universe, the source of all life and light and knowledge in a spiritual sense. What's the message? Oh, that this one has come into the world. John isn't the saviour. Philosophy, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, these are not saviours. This one coming into the world. The Word was made flesh and tabernacled amongst us. He came and he lived here for a while. He was still God while he was here. But he was truly man. He had a human soul. He was one of us. He's truly man. He's truly God. Not made in, the li not made in sinful flesh, but in the likeness of sinful flesh. Not born out of ordinary wedlock, born of a virgin, born miraculously, conceived of the Holy Ghost. This is what we are to know. All this is of crucial significance and of importance. This one came and was born as a babe in Bethlehem. All that is involved, says John, but he's gone back. He was here, he tempted amongst us, he tabernacled amongst us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This is what we need to know. This is the one who is our Savior. 
This is the one who has come to save us. This is our hope. This is my only comfort and consolation. Help has been laid on one who is mighty. Men can't help me. Men can't help themselves. No man can save himself. No man can atone for his sins or erase his past sins. I don't want teaching. I can't apply it. I need someone who can take hold of me. I need someone who can deliver me. I need someone who can put life into me. Here he is, the source of it all. God in the flesh. The word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Now that, you see, is the way in which John proceeds to comfort these early Christians. And it is the only comfort and consolation that's adequate to our condition. It's the message that we stand urgently in need of. Do you really believe this, my friend? Do you really believe that God hath visited and redeemed his people? Do you really believe that the Son of God left the courts of heaven temporarily in order to come down on earth to do this for you, to give you life? Is that what we believe? Well, how can we be as we are? Why isn't we are not on fire? Why is it we are not aflame? Why is it we are not exulting and glorying? Why is it that we are not manifesting it? Why is it that we are not lost in a sense of wonder and of love and of praise? How can we take these things so much for granted? How can we regard them as something almost ordinary? How can we talk so much about ourselves and so little about him? Why can we talk so much about our needs and so little about his fullness? These are the questions. Do we truly believe in him? Unless we are moved to the depth of our being by what we believe and by him himself. How can we grumble and complain? How can we be marasmic and almost lifeless if we really believe this? My friends, turn your eyes away from yourself. Look to him. Look at him. And stay there until you've seen him. You know it. And you're amazed and astonished. And you'll find that you'll be filled with life. Life anew. Life which is life indeed. Life which is life eternal. The comfort you need, the help we all need is this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust Audio Library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.